Welcome to another presentation of the New Testament. And in this presentation, we will take a look at the book of Acts, chapters 16 through 21. What it teaches us, what is happening, some of the principles we can learn. So, let's start with Acts, chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Why did Paul circumcise Timothy? As you know, the law of Moses has been fulfilled. Christ has ascended into heaven. So why are some of the things of the law still being practiced? Even though Gentile converts were not required to be circumcised or to observe other rituals of the law of Moses to be saved, Paul circumcised Timothy prior to their missionary labors together because of the Jews which were in those quarters. After being circumcised, Timothy could labor more effectively among the Jews who would feel that an uncircumcised missionary lacked respect for the God of Israel and his laws. Effective missionaries may alter behavior in some ways to avoid giving offense to those living in their fields of labor and making these changes to accommodate others' feelings, the missionaries would not disobey any gospel principles. For the sake of the gospel, at times Paul himself modified his behavior to reach both Jews and Gentiles. He also taught Gentile converts to willingly refrain from any behavior that might be perceived as offensive to the Jews, even though it may not be have been prohibited by any commandment. We're in a time period where you have this transition in the church. You have Jewish converts who have such strong-held traditions. And then you have the gospel truths that has changed some of the programs in the church. And so some are suffering, such as the Jewish converts, in grasping and believing and dropping these traditions. And Paul is just trying to be sensitive to that in any way they can. His circumcision is a matter is of expediency and sensitivity towards those he would serve rather than a requirement for salvation. The Jews had turned the law of Moses into what gave a person salvation instead of using it to point to Christ, who is the author of our salvation. The law of Moses had become tradition instead a type and a shadow of the great atoning sacrifice of the Savior. So all those years of apostasy between Malachi and Matthew, one of the great destructions to the Jewish people is that instead of using the law of Moses to point to Christ and teach about him and his atonement, it became traditional performances that you needed to do that would save you. And Paul is trying to teach the law of Moses. There is no salvation or justification or sanctification in living it. That can only be found in Christ. And that wicked one cometh and taketh away light and truth through obedience from the children of men and because of the tradition of their fathers. That's Doctrine and Covenants 93, 39. That's how Satan will attack the gospel and get people to believe is to take away their light and truth and to believe in tradition more than in truth. Now let's go to Matthew. Let me get this thing right here. Mm. 
Now let's go to Matthew 16, verses 1 through 3, continuing why Paul circumcised Timothy. Behold my soul. Now this is all from the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon people did not have the problem of transitioning from the law of Moses to the law of the gospel and of Jesus Christ. And here's why. Behold, my soul delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ. For for this end has the law of Moses been given. And all things which have been given of God from the beginning of the world unto man are the typifying of him. 2 Nephi 11.4 2 Nephi 25, 24 says, And notwithstanding we believe in Christ, we keep the law of Moses, and look forward with steadfastness unto Christ, until the law shall be fulfilled. Can you see how they used it to focus on Christ better, and it just didn't become a traditional program of ordinances and performances? Jacob 4, 5. Behold, they believed in Christ and worshiped the Father in his name, and also we worship the Father in his name. And for this intent, we keep the law of Moses, that is, to worship Christ, in pointing our souls to him. And for this cause, it is sanctified unto us for righteousness, even as it was accounted unto Abraham in the wilderness to be obedient unto the commandments of God in offering up his son Isaac, which is the similitude of God and his only begotten son. Alma 25, 15 through 16. Yea, and they kept the law of Moses, for it was expedient that they should keep the law of Moses as yet, for it was not all fulfilled. But notwithstanding the law of Moses, they did look forward to the coming of Christ, considering that the law of Moses was a type of his coming, and believing that they must keep those outward performances until the time that he should be revealed unto them. Now they did not suppose that salvation came by the law of Moses. But the law of Moses did serve to strengthen their faith in Christ. And thus they did retain a hope through faith unto, salv unto eternal salvation, relying upon the spirit of prophecy, which of those things to come. That is probably the best place where it is stated of how the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea did not use it to point to Christ. They had missed the point and turned the law of Moses into God himself, into God meaning that that is what will save you. See, we have to remember the law of Moses is a lesser law. They came to Mount Sinai and they were not worthy of of the Melchizedek priesthood and the law of the gospel. And so to teach them and help them, the Savior gave the law of Moses, which pointed to him. Let's go to Acts 16, 4 through 10. Christ through the Spirit guides and directs the church. In Acts 16, 6 through 10, we see the Lord directing his servants to where they were needed. This journey into Europe was a turning point in the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles, for the missionaries were soon able to preach with power among people who would listen to them. Modern apostles have had similar experiences that came from following the guidance of the Spirit. While serving a mission in England in 1840, President Wilford Woodruff, then one of the Twelve Apostles, was prompted by the Spirit to go to the south of England. 
though his efforts, through his efforts and the efforts of others serving him, about 2,000 people were converted in the area of Heffershire, Worcester, and Gloucester. Reflecting on his extraordinary period of his life, President Wilfred Woodruff wrote, The whole history of this Herefordshire mission shows the importance of listening to the still small voice of God and the revelations of the Holy Ghost. The Lord had a people there prepared for the gospel. They were praying for light and truth, and the Lord sent me to them. That's why in Acts 16, 4 through 10, the Spirit tells Paul he must go to another place instead of where he wanted to go because there were people that were being prepared. Elder Thomas S. Monson recounts how the president of the Quorum of the Twelve changed his stake visiting assignment to a place where a dying girl had prayed for him to come and give her a priesthood blessing. Neither the president of the Quorum of the Twelve nor Elder Monson knew about the young girl's prayer before the change was made. And I saw some great stories on how Christ runs this church through the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Let's go to Acts 16, verses 12 through 15, about Lydia, who is a seller of purple. Lydia appears to be Paul's first European convert. The best natural purple dye was extracted from the shells of mollusks, if I'm saying that right, and the process was very expensive. Therefore, in ancient times, the color purple became associated with the royalty or saintliness. Lydia worked as a dyer and a seller of purple cloth. She had the distinction of being Paul's first sec false first known European convert and also the first person mentioned by name who joined the church as a result of Paul's second mission. She appears to have been a wealthy woman who owned her own house and had servants who prepared who were part of the household. Larger later believers gathered at her home for worship and instruction. It is important to note that Lydia's heart was opened by God, which enabled her to not only hear the word of God being preached by Paul, but caused her to receive a witness of his truthfulness in her soul. Brothers and sisters, that's what we want. We want our hearts to be opened and the gospel to come in our hearts, not just hear it, but to get deep in our hearts, for that is where conversion is. Let's go to Acts 16, 16 through 18. Paul rebuked the evil spirit in the damsel. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, why the Lord and his servants reject the testimony of evil spirits. The testimony of the devil-led damsel was true. Paul and Silas were prophets. They had the words and the power of salvation. But true testimony from Satan's servants does not lead to salvation. In effect, the damsel was saying, Go ahead and believe in Saul and Silas and this Jesus whom they preach. I agree they and their master are of God. And since we are now united on that point, you can also continue to follow me and enjoy the fruits of my divination. And how many other practitioners of false religions there are who give lip service to Jesus and his doctrines so that people will the more readily follow them and their special brand of saving grace. It was for the very reason here involved that Jesus himself forbade the devils whom he cast out to testify that he was the Son of God. Jesus does not need the testimony of Satan or his followers. 
Let's go to Acts chapter 16, verses 19 to 33, concerning Paul and Silas being imprisoned. While in prison, we see Paul and Silas put, putting into practice God's teachings of, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. As they pray and sing praises unto God, instead of being bitter and resentful and disrespectful. As an earthquake occurred, the prison doors were opened and the prisoners' bands were loosed. Roman law stipulated that a jailer would be executed if he allowed capital criminal prisoners to escape. Thus, the keeper of the prison about to kill was about to kill himself. However, Paul reassured the keeper of the prison to do no harm to himself, for Silas, Paul and Silas were still there in the prison cell. They didn't leave. Isn't that interesting? Probably knowing of that custom and knowing that the jailer could be killed, they stayed within the jail even though he was one of their enemies. The keeper of the prison was so impressed with the integrity of Paul and Silas that he asked them what he must do to be saved, which now enabled Paul to teach the need for a belief in God and preach the word of God to him thus leading to baptism of the keeper of the jail. All because they practiced loving those who hate you or despitefully use you or persecute you. Elder Wilford Woodruff gives the following story concerning the influence we can have upon loving our enemies. On Sunday, the 8th, I preached at Fromes Hill in the morning, at Stanley Hill in the afternoon, and at John Benbow's farm in the evening. The parish church that stood in the neighborhood by Brother Benbow's neighborhood of Brother Bimbo's, presided over by the rector of the parish, was attended during the day by only 15 persons. While I had a large congregation estimated to a number of a thousand attending my meeting through the day in the evening. When I arose to speak at Brother Bimbo's house, a man entered the door and informed me that he was a constable, and he had been sent, he had been sent by the rector of the parish with a warrant to arrest me. I asked him for what crime. He said, for preaching to the people, I told him that I, as well as the rector, had a license for preaching the gospel to the people, and that if he would take a chair, I would wait upon him after meeting. He took my chair and sat beside me. For an hour and a quarter, I preached the first principles of the everlasting gospel. The power of God rested upon me. The Spirit filled the house, and the people were convinced. At the close of the meeting, I opened the door for baptism and served. Seven offered themselves. Among the number who were preached and the constable, the later arose and said, this is what the constable said, Mr. Woodruff, I would like to be baptized. I told him I would like to be baptized. To bap I told him I'd like to baptize him. I went down at the pool and baptized the seven. When then came together, I confirmed thirteen, administered the sacrament, and we all rejoiced together. See, Woodford would have could have been offended as constable that was breaking his rights and his civil liberties and became angry. But he practiced the gospel of love. The constable went to the rector and told him, that if he wanted Mr. Woodruff taken for preaching the gospel, he must go himself and serve the writ. For he had heard him preach the only true gospel sermon he had ever listened to in his life. The rector did not know what to make of it. 
So he sent two clerks of the Church of England as spies to attend our meeting and found out what we did preach. They both were pricked in their hearts, received the word of the Lord gladly, and were baptized and confirmed members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The rector became alarmed and did not venture to send anybody else. Proof that loving our enemies, doing good to those that despise us, and to have love in our hearts, which is a true principle from the Savior. Let's go to Acts 17, 11 through 12. They search the scriptures daily. After being persecuted by unbelieving Jews in Thessalonica, Paul and his companions traveled to Berea, where they taught in a synagogue and found the Jews more noble than those in Thessalonica, because they received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to determine if Paul's teachings were true. President Howard W. Hunter discussed how daily scripture study can lead to greater spiritual understanding. Quoting, it is certain that one who studies the scriptures every day accomplishes far more the one who devotes considerable time one day and then lets days go by before continuing. Not only should we study each day, but there should be a regular time set aside when we can concentrate without interference. It would be ideal if an hour could be spent each day, but if that much cannot be had, a half hour on a regular basis would result in substantial accomplishment. A quarter of an hour is little time, but it is surprising how much enlightenment and knowledge can be acquired in a subject so meaningful. So here we see that the Jews who studied the scriptures properly listened to Paul. And we have a modern prophet telling us that daily scripture study is going to be essential in our spirituality. Acts 17, 15 through 31, Paul preached in the city of Athens. Some people have called the city of Athens at the time of Paul's visit the world capital of idolatry. Paul's spirit was stirred when he arrived, for he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Many Greeks were polytheists, believing in many gods. The chief men of Athens gathered in the marketplace each day to hear debates, to conduct business, and to learn something new. Since Paul's message was new, he attracted listeners. At length, Paul was conducted to the famed Mars Hill to appear before the chief judicial council, the Areopagus, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, to explain the new doctrine he taught. Paul's sermons, sermon addressed God's true nature, man's responsibility to God, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul did not recite Jewish history or scripture as he typically did when teaching, Jew, teaching Jewish and God-fearing audiences. Instead, he taught the Athenians by establishing areas of common ground and trying to lead his hearers from those points of true points of doctrine that were contrary to tenets of Greek philosophy and religion. So he tried to meet them at where they were spiritually and have a common ground with them. Acts 17, 18, the Epicurean, Epicureans and the Stoics. In Athens, Paul encountered philosophers of Epicureans and Stoics. Epicureanism was named for Epicurus. <laughs> According to his philosophy, the world came into existence by chance and was without purpose or design. Epicureans believed that the gods, if they did exist, did not involve themselves in the lives of humans. 
and that happiness was to be found in the absence of cares and pain and the enjoyment of pleasures in moderation. Stoics, on the other hand, began with the teachings of a man named Zeno. Stoicism held that all things were created, ordered, and set in motion by divine reason. Stoics believed that man was endowed with a spark of reason and should seek harmony with the divine order of things, overcoming passions, and live a moral and upright life. A babbler that's mentioned in this verse is the English equivalent of the Greek slang word spermologos, the one who picks up scraps of information here and there. Acts 17.21 To hear some new thing. Like ancient Athenians, many people today seek to continue to learn and talk about new things. Elder Kevin R. Duncan of the 70 observed that in our day, when information and advice from many sources is widely available, we should remember to seek answers to our problems and what the Lord has revealed through his prophets. Quoting, this, wo this world is full of so many self-help books, so many self-proclaimed experts, so many theorists, education, educators, and philosophers who have advice and counsel to give on any and all subjects. With technology today, information on a myriad of subjects is available with the click of a keystroke. It is easy to get caught in the trap of looking to the arm of flesh for advice on everything from how to raise a child to how to find happiness. While some information was, has merit, as members of the church, we have access to the source of pure truth, even God himself. We would do well to search out answers to our problems and questions by investigating what the Lord has revealed through his prophets. Acts 17, 22 through 25, the unknown God. Paul complimented the Athenians, acknowledging that they were too superstitious, meaning they were most religious, that is, careful in divine things. Things. That's what that meant by too superstitious. The altar built by the Athenians to the unknown God, verse 23, is referred to in other historical sources as an altar to the unknowable God or to all gods not specifically known by name. The Athenians had apparently built this altar to avoid offending or neglecting some unknown deity. Paul referred to this altar as he began teaching that God can indeed be known by his children. Him declare I unto you, Paul said, and then he taught the Athenians some of what is known of God. Paul taught that God made the world and all things therein, and that he dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, The great creator by whom all things are dwelleth not in temples made by the hands of his creatures, but he is worshipped by them in his temples, which holy houses he visits occasionally, and in which sacred spots his spirit may always be found by the faithful. So we don't believe that God continuously lives in his temples. That he needs our temples made by hands to dwell in. We worship God in them and receive the spirit in them from God. Acts 17.26, the bounds of their habitations. Our life and the circumstances that surround them do not result from chance. The race and nation in which men are, man is, are born in this world is a direct result of their pre-existent life. 
The blessings I have received down here are because of my actions, how I lived before I came here. President Harold B. Lee expounded on this doctrine this way. Now then, to make a summary of what I have just read, may I ask of each of you the question, who are you? You are all the sons and daughters of God. Your spirits were created and lived as organized intelligences before the world was. You have been blessed to have a physical body because of your obedience to certain commandments in that pre-mortal state. You are now born into a family to which you have come, into the nation which you have come, as a result for the kind of lives you lived before you came here. And at a time in the world's history, as the Apostle Paul taught the men of Athens, and as the Lord revealed to Moses, determined by the faithfulness of each of those who lived before this world was created. And then President Joseph Fielding Smith added this. He taught that Paul's words in Acts 17.26, as well as Moses' teachings in Deuteronomy 32, 7-38, clearly indicate that the number of the children of Israel were known and the bounds of their habitations fixed in the days of old when the Lord divided to the nations their inheritance. We conclude, therefore, that there must have been a division of the spirits of men in the spirit world. And those who are appointed to be the children of Israel were separated and prepared for a special inheritance. The separation of people of spirits in the spirit world were done there long before we ever came here and divided into nations and nationalities into whether you were going to be a member of the house of Israel or not. Depending on the heed and diligence you gave to the knowledge and gospel and the living the gospel there. Acts 17, 28 through 29, we are the offspring of God. In his famous address on Mars Hill, Paul quoted from the Phenomena, I'm sure that I didn't say that right, a work by Aratus, a Sicilian poet, as certain, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Nearly identical words occurred in the hymn of Zeus, written by the early poet Clentheus. Both Aratus and Clentheus were Stoics, and citing these poets, Paul was establishing belief that he had in common with his listeners, and attempting to persuade them by citing sources they considered authoritative. So a good method of mission work is meeting people on common ground and on common beliefs that we have. President Thomas S. Monson clarified the doctrine taught in Acts 17.29. The Apostle Paul told the Athenians on Mars Hill that we are the offspring of God. Since we know that our physical bodies are the offspring of our moral parents, we must probe for the meaning of Paul's statement. The Lord has declared that the spirit and the body are the soul of man. Thus, it is the spirit which is the offspring of God. The writer of Hebrews refers to him as the father of spirits. The family of proclamation of the world also teaches this important doctrine. All human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. Each is a beloved son or daughter of heavenly parents, and as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. President Dallin H. Oaks said this very important statement of the First Presidency, spoke of the importance of seeing ourselves first and foremost as the spirit children of God, 
I don't know if you've noticed, but Satan is attacking our identity. He is trying to get people to identify with race, with ideology, with gender, with sexuality. All of those things which are not what make up our true identity. We are first and foremost spirit children of God. That is our true identity. Be careful how you characterize yourself. Don't characterize or define yourself by some temporary quality. The only single quality that should characterize us is that we are son, a son or daughter of God. That fact transcends all other characteristics, including race, occupation, physical characteristics, honors, or even religious affiliation. And I would go on to include even gender, sexuality, intersectionality, all of these false ideologies. Back to Elder Oaks. We have our agency, and we can choose any characteristic to define us, but we need to know that when we choose to define, define ourselves or to present ourselves by some characteristic that is temporary or trivial in eternal terms, we de-emphasize what is most important about us and we overemphasize what is relatively unimportant. This can lead us down the wrong path and hinder our eternal progression. Be careful and make sure you understand your true identity. Satan is being very clever in getting us to believe in all these different types of things that identify us, that are temporal, that sometimes are just untrue and are very dangerous. Acts 18, 6 and then 2026, 20, Paul shook his remnant. When the Jews in the synagogue in Corinth rejected his teaching, Paul shook his remnant and declared, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. In so doing, he was following the Israelite custom of enacting the blamelessness from the sins of those he taught. The Book of Mormon alludes to this practice when Paul declared, I will go into the Gentiles, he was stating that the Jews no longer be his top priority in teaching the gospel. Were this shaking your remnant to symbolize that I am not responsible for your false teachings because I taught you in the Book of Mormon is in 2 Nephi 9.44, Jacob 1.19 and Mosiah 2.27. Acts 19.1 through 6, baptism is to be followed by receiving the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist's influence is so powerful that it's still being felt years after and many miles removed from his actual ministry. However, the central truth of John's message has have been lost. John the Baptist clearly taught that another baptism of fire would follow his baptism of immersion. These, however, were baptisms performed by unauthorized persons and had to be performed again. The reception of the whole gift of the Holy Ghost followed. Joseph Smith said the following, Baptism was the essential point on which the disciples should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It seems that some sectarian Jew had been baptizing like John, but had forgotten to inform them that there was one to follow by the name of Jesus Christ to baptize with fire and the Holy Ghost, which showed these converts that their first baptism was illegal. And when they had heard this, they were gladly baptized. And after hands were laid upon them, and they received the, the gifts according to promise and spake with tongues and prophesied. Acts 19, 11 through 12, healed by the touch of a handkerchief. 
Acts 19, 11 through 12 records remarkable miracles of healing which were wrought by God through Paul. Items that Paul had handled were taken to the sick and they were healed. You can see Acts 5, 14 through 16 for an account of a similar healing. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, Healings come by the power of faith. There is no healing virtue or power in any item of clothing or other object, whether owned by Paul or Jesus or anyone. But rights and objects may be used to help increase faith. The people in Ephesus had sufficient faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that they were healed when Paul's handkerchief or aprons were brought to them. In our day, the ordinance of anointing the sick with consecrated oil helps to increase the faith of those involved and helps them call upon God's power and mercy. There's no healing power in the oil. It is an act that we do, that we can place our faith in. Latter-day Saint history contains similar experiences from the life of the prophet Joseph Smith. A miraculous healing occurred on July 22, 1839. After the prophet had healed many individuals near the small town of Montrose, Iowa, and was waiting for a boat to take him home, President Wilford Woodruff recalled, while waiting for the ferry boat, a man of the world, knowing of the miracles which had been performed, came to Joseph Smith and asked him if he would not go and heal two twin children of his, about five months old, who were both lying sick nigh unto death. There were some, they were some two miles from Montrose. The prophet said he could not go, but after pausing some time, he said he would send someone to heal them. And he turned to me, Wilford Woodruff, and said, You go with the man and heal his children. He took a red silk handkerchief out of his pocket and gave it to me and told me to wipe their faces with the handkerchief when I administered to them and they would be healed. I went with the man and did as the prophet commanded me and the children were healed. Again, the handkerchief did not heal them. It was an object to help them place their faith in Jesus Christ that healed them. Acts 19, 13 through 20. Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? False priests, who were sons of the chief priests in Ephesus, attempted to cast out an evil spirit out of a man. The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? The man with the evil spirit then attacked the false priests and overcame them. This experience teaches the principle that unembodied spirits who follow Satan recognize priesthood authority. But Bruce R. McConkie said of false priests, in imitation of the true order why where, whereby devils are cast out of people, false ministers, having no actual priesthood power, attempt to cast them out by exorcism. This ungodly practice was probably more common anciently than it is now because few people today believe either in miracles or in the casting out of literal devils. But over the years, it has not been uncommon for so-called priests to attempt to expel evil spirits from persons or drive them away from particular locations by incantations, conjurations, or adjurations. Satan and his followers are only demanded to leave by the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith taught, It is very evident that evil spirits possess a power that none but those who have the priesthood can control, as in the case of the sons of Sikva. 
Acts 19, 23 through 35, Diana and the Ephesians. Paul's success in bringing people to Christ's church negatively affected the economy of Ephesus, while relied, which relied upon income from visitors to the temple of Artemis. Artemis was the Greek name for the Roman goddess Diana. And the temple built to her in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It drew pilgrims from all over the empire, as well as local merchants who earned their living selling temple visitors food, lodging, dedicatory offerings, and souvenirs. The theater at Ephesus, the goddess Artemis Craftsman, who made and sold images of the goddess provoked a public uprising against Paul and his messengers and his message. A large crowd gathered in the theater at Ephesus, which could hold 24,000 people, and chanted for two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Paul wanted to address the crowd, but he was dissuaded by church members and government authorities who were concerned for his safety. Shortly thereafter, Paul left the city, traveling through Greece and Macedonia and strengthening church members. So you can see why some in cities were upset with Paul that if he converted people, they would no longer buy their idols to, of Diana as souvenirs and it would affect their economy and why they became so angry. Acts 19, 35 through 40, claiming, calming the crowd. Just as Gamaliel had done at Jerusalem and Alexander Donovan, Donovan would later do at Far West Missouri, this town's clerk appealed for order and due process of law, if indeed there had been any infraction of law. Irresponsible action could jeopardize local auto autonomy. Roman authorities could counsel freedom for cities whose native officials were unable to maintain peace and order. So they didn't want the Roman soldiers in the city and them cracking down upon law and order. And so that's why this clerk is appealing for order of the people against Paul. Acts 27 to 12, the first day of the week. Acts 27 contains one of the first instances that indicates the new Sabbath on the first day of the week, Sunday. Paul participated in the ordinance of the sacrament with other Christians. In celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christians partook of the sacrament on the first day of the week. See verse 7, and it's also John 7, or it's also John 20, verse 1. This same pattern is followed in the church today. While Paul is preaching to the assembled disciples, a young man named Eutychus was accidentally killed, and Paul's exercise of priesthood power restored him to life. With the raising of Eutychus from death, Paul joined with others who exercised this priest of power, men like the Savior, Peter, Elijah, and Elisha. Acts 20:28, 20, Feeding the Flock Knowing of the apostasy that would soon begin among the Ephesian saints, Paul admonished church leaders to feed the church of God. One of the most important ways church leaders do this is by nourishing members with the good word of God. To be nourished by the word of God is one of the greatest protections against apostasy. That's why you must continually hold to the rod of iron if you are going to make it to the tree. We must hold fast to the word of God. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles expressed how church members seek spiritual nourishment today. Most people don't come to church looking merely for a few new gospel facts 
or to see old friends, though all of that is important. They come seeking a spiritual experience. They want peace. They want their faith fortified and their hope renewed. They want, in short, to be nourished by the good word of God, to be strengthened by the power of heaven. Those of us who are called upon to speak or teach or lead have an obligation to help provide that as best we, as we possibly can. Acts 20, 29-30, Paul warned of the coming apostasy. As he bade farewell to the church leaders in Ephesus, Paul warned them that an apostasy was coming and that it would be the result of forces working on both outside the church, grievous wolves, and inside the church of your own selves. The Greek word apostasia, which was translated as fallen away in 2 Thessalonians 2.3, is closer in meaning to rebellion or revolution. Thus, church members themselves contributed to the great apostasy by rebelling against church leaders and doctrine. Priestcraft was an important element of this eternal rebellion. Paul's words in Acts 20, verse 30, provide a definition of priestcraft that can also be seen in 2 Nephi 26. 29. Elder James E. Talmage, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, affirms Paul's message. Not only would outsiders ingrati ingratiate themselves with the saints for purposes of selfish gain, wolves entering in and not sparing the flock, but schisms and divisions were eminent, and these dissensions were to come through some then present. Men who would aspire to leadership and who would set up their own doctrines, thus drawing disciples away from the church and into themselves. I don't know if you ever notice that even today our greatest enemies are not those outside the church. It's the apostates that have come from within that cause the most destruction. Discussing the origins of the great apostasy, President Joseph Fielding Smith declared that some of it was the result of evil men who moved in and displaced the authority of the apostles. Quoting, In time all ordinances of the gospel were changed, commandments were broken, and the simple principles of the gospel were mixed with pagan philosophy by the grievous wolves and apostate disciples who displaced the prophets and apostles who had divine communion with the heavens. Spiritual darkness set in, and unrighteous men took command and closed the heavens against themselves. Visions and contact with the heavens ceased, and the gifts of the Spirit came to an end. The blessings and presence of the twelve apostles ceased, and the city went forth that they were no longer needed. You see that among the apostates today in the church. Notice that among them there are no gifts of the Spirit. Acts 21.13 I, I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die. While Paul and his fellow laborers were staying at the home of Philip, a certain prophet named Agabus visited them and prophesied that Paul would be bound if he continued to Jerusalem. It is obvious that Abigus had the Spirit of the Lord with him, for Paul was later bound in Jerusalem. Paul, who once persecuted and consented to the death of Christians, was now ready to suffer persecution and even death for the Lord Jesus Christ. For some time, Paul had sensed that in Jerusalem he would face opposition. Yet, he was determined to go in person to deliver the donations he had gathered for the poor of the Jerusalem saints. 
From Paul's determination to go to Jerusalem, we learn that even if a certain course in life will bring adversity, it may still be the right path to pursue. We also learn that we should put the Lord first regardless of the consequences. President Ezra Taft Benson described the convictions of true disciples of Jesus Christ by saying, Men changed for Christ will be cap captained by Christ. Their will, their will is swallowed up in his will. They do always those things that please him. Not only would they die for the Lord, but more importantly, they would want to live for him. Sometimes I think that's harder. To live with integrity to the gospel in Jesus Christ and being completely faithful to our covenants. Acts 21, 17 through 21. Jewish Christians and the Law of Moses. When Paul arrived in Jerusalem, he discovered that many Jewish converts were troubled by reports that he had been speaking out against the Law of Moses during his missions, and particularly against the practice of circumcision. The implications of the Jerusalem Conference decisions concerning the Law of Moses, that's in Acts 15, 6 to 31, were still unclear to many mem church members. You understand these new converts are having a hard time making the change, making the switch. This is new to them, and it's taking a while. According to the Bible Dictionary, the church under the direction of Peter and the Twelve, and acting under the guidance of the Spirit, declared that circumcision was not obligatory for Gentile converts. However, it apparently did not settle the matter of whether or not Jewish members of the church should have their children circumcised. As one reads the scriptures on the matter, it becomes evident that the real issue was not circumcision only, but also the larger question as to continued observance of the law of Moses by members of the church. As I said earlier, the Jewish converts are having a hard time letting go of this law that they have turned into tradition instead of using it to point them to Christ. They are still struggling. And that's okay if people struggle with things in the church. We should be patient and loving and kind towards them. The Jewish part of the church membership, especially in Jerusalem, appears to have been very reluctant to cease from the rituals and ceremony of the law of Moses. This is a marked contrast to the church among the Nephites, in which there seems to have been a cessation of the law immediately upon their awareness of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as you noted earlier, we read references that showed that they understood the true meaning of the law of Moses and that now it was fulfilled in Christ to which it pointed to. Jewish, Acts 21, 21-37, Jewish Purification Rites. It is evident from Acts 21, 21 that Jewish Christians in Jerusalem had misunderstood Paul's teachings about the law of Moses. Even though Paul and the other apostles had taught that circumcision was not a requirement for Gentile converts, they had not discouraged Jewish converts from following the practice or from observing other aspects of the law of Moses. Jewish Christians continued to worship in the temple, and Paul still considered himself an observant Jew. To help dispel ill feelings towards Paul, Church leaders encouraged Paul to participate in the week-long temple purification rites that observant Jews customarily underwent after traveling in Gentile lands. Paul's public observance of these temple rites would demonstrate that he did not teach against the law or 
the temple as was rumored. Sidney B. Sperry of Latter-day Saint Scholar explained, the apostle realizing the gravity of the problem and knowing that it was important to hold the Jewish and Gentile groups of the church together, readily agreed to assume the role of peacemaker. The temple rituals would occupy seven days of purification and sacrifice. Paul would pray, would pay for the four lambs and eight pigeons used for sacrifice and would attend the four men in their temple appearances and rituals. In so doing, the apostle would be obliged to cross the court of the Gentiles and the court of women, enter the court of Israel, and finally approach the altar on which burnt offerings were made. He was bound to be in full view of either friend or foe in these temple areas. And so they're trying to make certain accommodations, maybe certain things that really doesn't matter. They're not a part of the gospel, but these new members are having a hard time. And so they're trying to walk this fine line of keeping the Jews and the Gentile converts together, even though they have different views. Paul followed the church leader's suggestion that he visit the temple and participate in Jewish purification rites. At one point, Jews from Asia confronted Paul in the temple and caused a riot against him. They accused him of teaching against the law of Moses and the temple and of bringing a Gentile into the inner courts of the temple where Gentiles were forbidden. Though Paul was innocent of these charges, they were capital offenses, and Paul's life was in peril as the crowd dragged him out of the temple and began to beat him. Acts 21, 20 through 25, Elder Bussar McConkie explained. This is an extremely difficult passage to explain in such a way as to do credit to Paul or to James, the Lord's brother, or to the leading brethren in the church, or to the Jewish segment of the church established in Jerusalem. A quarter of a century has passed since the death of the Lord. The law of Moses is fulfilled. Circumcision is no longer an approved part of true worship. The particular customs and practices of the Jews are false and da damning. The Nazarite system of vows and sacrifices is destructive of the faith, which, centered in Christ, leads to life and salvation. And yet, to humor Jewish Christians, particularly converted church members who still practice false rites and cling to false ordinances, who are giving lip service to Christ while following the mosaic performances which Christ abolished, who were Christian in name, but largely Jewish in act, who had the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, but have never attained the spiritual maturity to, con to gain the full companionship of that member of the Godhead, to humor these weak members of the church, Paul is asked officially as a member of church discipline to pretend that he is Jew, is a Jew who keeps the law of Moses. Again, they're trying to keep the church together between two groups that have two competing ideologies. And that they're trying to teach them both, especially the Jewish converts are struggling the most because of how much they turn the law of Moses into a tradition that would save you. Why? What justification can there be for these early saints to reject the spirit and practice of true religion and pretend to conform to the dead letter of a dead law, to a law which can lead nowhere except to spiritual death? The explanation lies in the semi-converted status of the Jewish saints in Jerusalem. As with all men, the Lord was giving gospel truths to them line upon line, precept upon precept, 
It was better to have them in the church seeking the Spirit, striving to keep the commandments, and trying to work out their salvation, than to leave them without the fold until they gained a full knowledge of all things. Even Peter was not converted to the full until long after he was ordained an apostle. And so it is today. Conversion is a gradual process. There are many sectarian concepts and practices which individuals who are in the church must abandon before the gospel system becomes perfect. If there is a lesson for us in these events, it is that staunch and stable members of the church should be tolerant and charitable toward persons newly coming out of the darkness of the world into the light of the gospel. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.